morning. Uh, this is Hesway's Mains. It is April 7th, Thursday, and um, we are talking about S287 again, um, continuing our conversations for the, from the last few days. And um, I am going to turn it over to Emily. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we are going to hear from um, a lot of her and Tony first about um, her district's experience with the universal income form. Um, and then we are gonna jump back into modeling with Julia. Um, any announcements or questions or anything like that before we get started? Okay. Carolina, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've heard rumor that you all have been working really hard on getting income data from your school members. So love to hear about that. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, so yes, hi, I'm Carlotta Simons Parentoni. I'm the principal here at Waits River Valley School, which is in East Corinth, uh, Orange County. Um, we have uh, just about 250 scholars K to eight. So uh, we call it, we consider ourselves a big small school. Uh, the uh, so yes, we are a system, I think all systems, but I can attest to, to what we're doing that have spent a lot of time to make sure that uh, with universal meals or with uh, provision two, that we still acquire the data and family information that we need, not only to support our food program, but knowing um, the necessity for that information for our title funds um, and uh, grant aspects that we work hard on. So we've spent a lot of time over the last few years really trying to educate the communities. Uh, and we have two communities who feed into one school. Um, the two communities about what that information is used for. Um, we've tried to move away from the immediate reaction that it's all about um, income and free and free and reduced meals, which of course it is, but we've really worked hard to show families that the resources that we have available here come from that data as well. Um, so a big change that we made a couple of years ago that has been phenomenal in our percentages is that about midsummer. I send my welcome, my initial welcome letter to families. Um, and in that, I only include the household information paperwork with a self-addressed stamped envelope. Um, that and, and I say, this is probably one of the most important documents outside of the emergency contact that we need and we use it for this purpose. And could you get that back to us as soon as possible? <laughs> Families about midsummer are really um, starting to think about school starting again, especially that the younger population, they get really excited to get mail from the school. And so they put it you know, on that pile of let's get to that right now. And so we get about 85% of our population's paperwork back then. Um, and then... <laughs> And we say to them, you know, in the, in the fall, the start of the school, and those of you who are parents uh, of school age youth know the big stack that comes home the first week of school and how, especially if you have multiple children, that how it's, you just want to stamp things, you know, eventually there's so many things to fill out. So we really work hard to separate it. Um, and have it be the first thing that they do for us. And then I have the list of who we don't have information from, you know, and then we go through the direct cert list, which if we match up with that, we can bypass that information. And then, you know, it's usually about 10 to 15 families that we work on to reach out to um, independently. We still, of course, have a few families who continually um, feel that it's a breach of their personal information and they don't want to contribute it. And they you know, immediately feel that they wouldn't qualify for free meals. So that's information we don't need. And we still you know, work with them, but ultimately then it's you know, their final decision. But 
uh, right now out of 260, well, excuse me, 250 scholars, I know there are eight that we don't have information from. And actually tonight is our first open house with, um, with the communities live in our building. And that's on my list if I see them and I have a moment to um, privately check in with them, you know, just a, a reminder piece. Um, but we've found it very, very successful um, to look at it as information that helps with our funding in, as a whole um, and, and try to move the stigmatism away from it. It's about all about food and uh, private information. Wow, but those... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, your numbers are incredible. Um, and it sounds like you have a really clear process in place, I'm kind of blown away. Um, well, I think to, you know, uh, the longevity piece, I, this is my 13th year here. So I, I do think that the more relationship-based you are with families, um, the more successful you can be in attaining that. So I say that not to say it wouldn't be successful in schools that have a turnover in leadership, but that it, I really think, <clears throat> excuse me, it's very important to determine who has the communication with the families that has the best relationship. So there's some of that work too, of looking at it systems wise of who, who here do the families engage with and trust enough that they can call them and have those types of conversations. Cause I have had that where I say to the school counselor, you know, I think, you know, you are the one with this one. Can you try them? Uh, or sometimes it's a special educator and, and they, they aren't necessarily seeking the information, but they're explaining the need uh, and then going from there. We've had a couple of times that we've had, you know, especially with the direct certification list where we've invited families here and we've helped them to complete that documentation because some of those pieces seem really big and, and they are, well, they don't seem, they are big. There's so many steps involved with it, but, uh, but definitely the more personal you can make it, um, the more um, dedicated they are to, to, to keeping that established relationship of communication and such. We're talking about simplifying the form really significantly to make it easier for families. Um, I'm curious, two things. One, um, are there sort of pieces that you um, think are really important that your data that you're getting from that, that's sort of outside of what the data collection needs are that you would want us, you know, you'd want to be maintained. And then my other question is, are you doing this all on paper and then doing the data entry in-house? This will be, uh, uh, so uh, part two of your question. Uh, mm -hmm. We, uh, of course, are deeply engaged with Infinite Campus, you know, and that uh, family data collection for the state in multiple pieces. The goal, of the data management team here in the district is that we look at doing more online to hopefully simplify the process for the system needs. Um, here, particularly, we, we really focus on the paper and then we enter it. Um, there are many, I mean, we, we live in a community where access to technology is very limited, you know, and, and the broadband piece is, has just not made its way here. So it's, it's really necessary for a large percentage of them anyway. Um, so, so yes, we do it on paper and then we enter it into the system after. Uh, as far as, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mumbling, but I think and talk sometimes often at the same time. But um, I do think that if we had better internet access for families and more equitable access, that we would definitely pursue the online option for families. I, you know, most families um, who are technology adept are more than content to do that. So I, th I don't see that with systems who have that access as being any form of an issue. Um, 
the paperwork itself, simplifying it, you know, there's nothing in life that we couldn't use a more simplified uh, process. <laughs> so uh, the it would be wrong of me to say simplifying it wouldn't be great. Um, the change in the format in the forms over the last couple of years has, you know, for our traditional families, you know, there was some educational piece there to help them see that it's the same form. It's just a, it's the same information. It's just a different form or different format. Um, and so if it were to change, it would be great to know that ahead and help families, you know, in the middle of the summer when I, I do that, that outreach, but I think any information, you know, the, the who qualifies ultimately and who doesn't is the most important information for our grants and, and our title funds and such. So anything in there that's not necessary, it would be, of course, great just not to have it. But um, I'm not aware that I don't think it's a complicated form, so I'm not. I'm not thinking there's something that's asked that's too much or too little. I think it's pretty cut and dry. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I really appreciate that. Um, anyone else have any? Go. Thank you. I'm wondering, thanks a lot, um, about when people send in that envelope, who it goes to and do they know that it won't be opened by anybody? And I wonder when you said kids are so excited to have something in the mail from the school, is there colorful stuff on the outside of the envelope so they're sure, more sure not to miss it or seed packets or a piece of chocolate? Right. Or, you know, I don't know, right. to really make sure people open it. Yes, thank you. Well, to be honest, the last couple of years, it's included a very special opening day mask to wear to school. So ah. the, coming, <laughs> the coming fall, I assure our hope is to include something more exciting uh, and new for them. Uh, the, um, but yes, the letter clearly says uh, it actually gets sent to Amy Kramer, who is uh, our, you know, I say my, but it's not, it's not my school and she's not mine, but it's, I'll just use that term, my role. Um, Amy is the administrative assistant who works with me. And so it's clearly the envelope is addressed uh, to attention to her. And I clearly state in my letter that Amy, in fact, I say we may not because we have access universal meals and now are working at provisional too. I do say we, we may not necessarily even open them. You know, we just pile them up and make sure we have, which we do open them, but um but that no one's looking at that information. It's not shared with anyone. It goes to Amy and she puts it into the system and um, that's the end of it. Um, unless someone needs to uh, resubmit for a change in their, in their life um, during the year. But, um, but the letter itself that the scholars anticipate and the families anticipate is by all means, they have a history of knowing that it's a very upbeat, positive, um, you know, I miss you and, and can't wait. And usually I request, you know, some summer artwork that they drop <laughs> off or, or give that, you know, let them know where to pick up um, books that we've made available. Um, and then we've accessed the summer meals uh, program, which is uh, for the last two summers, which has been a great opportunity to deliver it um, house to house, door to door versus the on site. So that's given us a lot of personal connection with families that, you know, they, again, they get excited because they're seeing you and then they have mail from you. And um, it's truly, you know, that relationship, but I hear what you're saying. And I think that's a piece too that schools. And I think all schools do that they really look at who has that relationship with families that they can talk about those sensitive subjects with, um, that it's a safe conversation. And so making sure that you pick who those people are. If I had it sent back to classroom teachers, I mean, they, the teachers, they love them, but it's a new relationship and they don't have, you know, they're uncomfortable sharing some of those personal pieces. Now, if I did it in December, they would readily send it to the classroom teachers, but August is too soon for that. 
Oh, how did this? I I probably should know, but I don't. How does the Universal Meals um, go? You talked about having meals in the summer. How does the Universal Meals that we're considering uh, work with the summer meals? Well, the, the summer meals program for the last couple of years has allowed anybody from birth to 18 who lives in the community to access it. So, um, so that's really expanded our opportunity to provide food to the communities as a whole. Um, and we normally um, communicate with our area high schools because we have high school choice. So a number of our, all of our um, adolescents are attending area high schools. So we just let them know that they're on our list and we're dropping, you know, food there. The, um, but so yes, every, every human, you know, every scholar, every, you know, pre-K and high schooler have access to food. But the, does the, that's, would Universal Meal Fund Carol? We'll have time for Universal oh, Meals yeah. at some point soon. We're, we're gonna... likely to get the bill. Yeah. So I just all right, all right. probably. Thank you. Oh, we're doing the forms. We're doing sorry. the forms. We're doing the forms. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, so sorry. Any other forms? Yeah. Anyone else have any forms questions? Yeah. Just comment. I appreciate that you call your students scholars. Ah, <laughs> thank nice, you. Nice touch. <clears throat> Ah, it is. Um, I smile. This is my 35th year in Vermont public education. Uh, not um, only the last 13 years as an administrator, but um, but yes, it is over the years. I I people recognize me by that statement. <laughs> thank you very much for spending this time with us today. And thank you so much for your 35 years of service. Oh, for it is. Scholars. The best profession ever. Uh, I highly <laughs> recommend it. Thank you. Take care. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Oh, that scholars language too. Yeah. Um, Julia, do you want to join us here? Um, if you can find your way over there. Oh. And Caleb, I think I gave you my phone charger like a week ago. Oh, do you know whatever phone I'm charger? Okay, okay, then I'm sure I tucked it away somewhere. Um, Thank you. Yeah, okay, I great. Okay, thanks. Bye. If you need one, I have. No, oh, I will find my way. Okay. <laughs> Julia, hi. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. So I think you are doing some modeling for us. Yes, Julia Richter, Joint Fiscal Office. Um, I. I guess it's up to you how you would like me to go about this. There are some updated or new transition models uh, following the committee's discussion a couple of days ago that have been posted under my name on the on the committee page. There's also the updated um, percentage of students within cost factor categories to include those statewide percentages that was requested also on the committee page. What would be of the most help? Like, what order would you like me to start? Does anyone have anything they want to cover on the demographics before we sort of go back into transitions? No. Okay, great. Then we'd love to hear about the three-year transitions that you built okay, out. Okay, sure. So I, there are two three-year transitions that we have modeled here that are posted on the page. One is to reflect the same construct that we spoke about a couple of days ago with those two simultaneous transitions of, of transitioning in the cost factor adjustments and transitioning out the weights. There's also the three-year transition that moves immediately to ADM. So it does not transition out the weights over a three-year or five-year time period, but goes immediately to ADM and then transitions in the cost factor adjustments over three years. So I guess if it makes sense to the to the committee, I think it makes the most sense to start with the the. I think new. people are curious about the immediate. Okay, sure. like that seems to be yeah. the okay. one that people are the most. And people folks seem, should yeah. 
Well, folks should refresh, first of all, if you haven't yet, if you want to find those things on the website. Oh. Um, I needed to do that myself. Mm -hmm. um, so they're under Julia's name. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to, just because it's going to be on my mind, so I'll ask it now. I'm assuming that the uh, right hand column percent change is going to be the same under every one of these. Right? Correct. So I don't need to keep checking it. No, so those are all the same. They've been put on there just so that you don't need to be grabbing the same multiple documents. I think it's good, and I think it's an important point. This is just a question of how quickly we get there, not where we get. Yes. Right. So thank you for that. So if you open up table C, um, and the letters are arbitrary, it's just so that it's easy for us to keep track of which table we're talking about. So if you open up the, the table C, um, as Chair Ansel just noted, a lot of the numbers and things that you're seeing here are really the same as what we were looking at a couple of days ago. What we're really looking at is those differences in the rates over the year, over the transition years. So just to briefly remind the committee looking at this table in the, in the two left columns, we've got county and then the school district. Uh, in the next column that's titled FY 2020 adjusted rate, this is sort of the base rate. So what we're comparing it to and, and per the committee suggestions, there are the assumptions there at the bottom that talk about how these adjusted rates were calculated. I'm sorry, I have yes, another ahead. question. I'm just, I got lost in the words. I don't see the difference in labeling between table C and table B in the in the uh, title of it. What, which one, how are they different? So table. Table C says transition into cost factor adjustments, assuming constant spending. And that's what table B says. Right. So those those titles are the same because they represent different transitions. There's table B, which is falls above that, and table C, what falls above that. Those titles are the same because. How do I know which one's which? Underneath it says transition overview, and that describes what the transition is happening. I would be happy to adjust the title if that would be. Well, they're both happening in over three years. I'm just trying to understand okay. how they're different. Table C drops goes from, Julia, do, sorry, you can answer. So, so table B is the simultaneous transitions. So that's phasing out of the weights over time. Oh, it doesn't phasing, say that, okay. Correct. Um, so that's phasing out the weights over time and phasing in the ADM phasing in the cost factor adjustments, whereas table C is moving immediately to the ADM. So it's not phasing out the weights. Um, does, does anyone have, yeah, any have sort of that basic frame? Of this I one? just got yes, you had your. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so table B, so we probably should relabel them so that people can actually find them, but table B is the, uh, phasing in and phasing out, table C is just phasing in. Correct. And, okay. I like to think of table C as less confusing. <laughs> so less table, moving parts. Less moving parts. That's much better. Thank you, Scott. Chris, hey. did you have something before? I'm just curious, like, the numbers are all the same. Are they supposed to be? Yeah. <clears throat> the same. The end point is the same. The end point is the same. So, so... Um, can I take a step back and just please do? Okay. So there's three tables under my name. Um, two of those tables follow a similar, follow the transition that we spoke about a couple of days ago, right? With, with the two simultaneous transitions. Okay. One is over five years, which is what we spoke about. One is new to the committee, but the only difference in that construct is instead of it being over five years, it's now over three years. And that's B. And that's B. The only reason that that is being presented to the committee today is so that you can more easily compare different scenarios to each other. So table A and table B follow the same construct in terms of those two simultaneous transitions. Now moving on, table B and table C are both over three years, but differ in terms of how they're getting from the beginning to the end. So 
there are going to be, as, as you just mentioned, a lot of the same numbers in there because we're using in all of these transitions, the same base rate and we're ending up with the same final rate. So it's gonna be the same dollar change, the same percentage change when you're going from start to finish. The only difference that we're looking at in all of these different tables is how we get from beginning to end. Okay? So, so, and I'm happy to retitle these if that would be helpful. I think I have to so people will know what, which one they're looking at, but yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so, so table C to be clear, that is a new transition compared to what we spoke about a couple of days ago. It's a new transition because it's not phasing out the pupil weights over three years or over five years. It's saying, okay, we're going to get rid of the pupil weights completely. And we're going to go immediately to long-term average daily membership. We're also going to phase in the cost factor adjustments over three years. So that's what you're seeing here in table three, moving immediately out of pupil weights and then phasing in the cost factor adjustments over three years. When, so when we say phasing in cost factor adjustments, I wanna just be sure I understand what that, what that means. So we don't use cost factor adjustments now. Correct. Uh, we and 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 we're we're no so we're no longer using weights and we're no longer using old weights. I guess that's you know, sort of follows. But what do we mean by phasing in? So so in the, so so in when when I'm referring to phasing in, that's an even proportion increase in the cost factor adjustment amount over the certain amount of years that the committee would decide they wanted to do the transition. So in this case, we have a three-year transition. So that means in year one, districts are gonna be receiving one third of the cost factor adjustments that would be calculated for them. Year two, it would be two thirds. And year three, it would be three thirds or all of the cost factor adjustments. You, you could also do this over more years it would just be a difference in terms of that proportionate change by the number of years that you chose to transition into the new system. Okay. Jim. Yeah, so um, in that model, third, 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 or whatever it is, uh, is the old system winding down while the newer system, system winding up as we discussed previously? So that's, that's that construct is being um, modeled in table B. Okay. Um, well, I have a question. Maybe it's for table B, not for this one. Um, okay, I'll let's hold it. Okay. Um, so table C, Julia, when you, any other questions about sort of the construct for table C? Okay. Julia, when you look at it, what do you see here? I did some scanning, but I was I imagine your eyes are scanning more effectively than mine. Sure. So so a couple of things that I notice um, when looking at table C in comparison to other transition constructs that we've looked at as a committee, or you've looked at um, is that in some districts the base rate may go up and then down. So a peak. Um, so but the base rate's the same, but then it correct. Moves, so in year one it moves up or down. Right, so in, so when moving from the base to the end, even if in the, in the end it's going to be moving down, in some districts you will see that it's going first up and then down past where it was originally. So, so, so can you point out a couple of those? Sure. Um, Anthony. So which one? Mount Anthony. Those yeah. 135, the ones that we have. Where's that? Oh, I see it. Oh, okay. We're in C. Right now. So you, you also see Granville Hancock, which is number three in Addison, starts at 166.5 in the base year. Then it's going to go up to 186.4 and then back down to 
but those are like a tenth of a penny. That's my that's difference. what I'm trying to get my head around. So <laughs> it's you know that's how many decimal point. points do we go out for this to be for this to have spiking to be yeah. meaning? Yeah, Scott. I mean, looking at scanning through that, I think the theme is is that the districts that do experience this yeah. porpoising effect are districts that have, I call it porpoising. I like that. I love it. Very good. <laughs> I thought you were going to slip that one by. Yeah. I, just, uh, I used to be a marine biologist. No, just <laughs> um, They seem to occur in districts that in the end are going to experience a very small, you know, change overall. Yeah. 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 And and the differences are they're small. I mean, yeah. they're teeny. For the most part. Uh, is it any word word? Isn't you said for the most part? Um, I mean, I'm sure you could pick out some that aren't, and some that are, but oh. but but generally speaking, if if a district is experiencing a very small change, okay. they're more likely to experience this effect. Yes. Districts that are receiving yeah. big changes aren't going to I can see the oh, Julia, do you, I want to let you sort of um, point out any other. So, is there anywhere that it's sort of more than one decimal point that we're talking about with the corpus? Um, I haven't, I would have to go back and check. I haven't gone through every district. All right, I have, but I don't have that in front of me. Um, that was just the, the thing I wanted to point out. Um, there are some. There are some examples, for instance, um, I'm looking at Bellows Falls in Wyndham, the first district. The base rate is $1.652, and then it goes up to $1.811, and then back down to $1.799. So as you mentioned, I mean, those are small changes, um, but there are some more dramatic changes within that year. So it's not going to be... Um, for instance, in Bellows Falls, it's a penny and a half going up in year one. Uh, no. Caleb? No, it's not 15 cents. 15. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, there you go. Um, yeah. I'm just looking at, I'm comparing B and C, and it does seem that C. Table B and C, not yes. column B and C, right? That's right, sorry, Great. table okay. B and table C, yes. Yeah. Um, the yields in table B pretty much go down by the same amount every year, you yeah. know, within, within a couple. Um, whereas the yields in table C go down by a steeper amount each year. And, and I think that's because in year one, you've just, you've gotten rid of any weighting and you only put in a third of the cost equity factor. So basically the state's doing the less adjustment that we've ever really done before in year one. What that means for like, say a district like Granville Hancock, which we're looking at, they're making their full, you know, they've got an 18 cent adjustment to make. They're making a 20 cent adjustment in the first year. And then they're basically just staying flat. Um, you know, it's taking down very slightly from, you know, 1.864 to 1.844 over two years, but their initial jump is huge, the 20 cent jump. So it's like, um, I would say that C seems again to sort of have some additional volatility to it. And especially the fact that some districts, instead of, they see their whole, like in the case of Granville, they really see their whole change in one year. Um, and so that is a real difference of C as compared to, to B, where we still have this kind of feathering out of one system and feathering into the other, whereas this is feathering out of one and just like knocking the other off the table. It's fairly, um, you know, that, that's a relatively big difference. Uh, so a couple of points. Um, with respect to that, I think if we decide that one of, so I, I like the, uh, the, the single system rather than the dual system, um, because I think it's simpler. You're not running two systems. If we can't make it work, we can't make it work. But if one way of making it work is to identify the outliers um, and, and figure out a solution for them, uh, not necessarily have the same thing apply to everybody. But the other thing I was going to ask is, and this is for the math people in the room, is 
given the fact that we're using data that's out of date, what, how many uh, decimal points should we be running these out? Because it, it, when people look at them, they start thinking that there's a significant difference when the difference is really, you know, in the, in the uh, second or third decimal point. And it doesn't, um, it, we're using old data. It doesn't seem like it's really, not, the numbers just don't feel valid enough to me. So, so if, 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 if people who know more about this stuff than I do can offer an opinion on how, how many decimal points we should be using, let's make a decision about that. Do we? Um, related comment, I think. Um, uh, and given that we acknowledge that we're using old data, constant spending, which we won't have, and that sort of stuff. Um, the, one, the one concern I have about the focusing effect is the districts where there's more radical change that are trying to adjust their budgets um, on a year by year basis to get from you know year one to year three or whatever it is. Um, I'm wondering how much it's worthwhile driving them nuts to put it in great mm -hmm. just colloquial terms, you know, terminology. Um, and I'd like to avoid that the porpoising effect if we, if we can for those where the transition is really pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so I'll just leave that as a comment and we'll see how we get there. Juliet, what's your thought on the decimal point? I think it's a great point, um, especially because, as you mentioned, we are working with all of these assumptions and we are working with outdated data. So it really, as you mentioned, Sharon Hansel, it doesn't make sense to, to compare down to the penny because at the end of the day, it's not going to be down to the penny, right? So I think that a question, a policy question for the committee may be, where would it be, where would you like us to highlight um, or, or, or highlight where changes are are greater than a certain threshold for, for you to be able to see, you know, which districts have a change that's greater than X percent. Um, that, that could be a way for the committee to, to wrap their heads around, you know, where are the big changes happening? So I'm... I think there was a chart at one point that dropped out some of the districts and the problem with that is that people want to know why and what's behind it. I think it, my thought would be, with, and not knowing that this is a valid way to do it, is to have fewer decimal, do more rounding uh, than we're doing. I'm not sure exactly where, but do more rounding and then color code, you know, have, have uh, red for one group, uh, Green for another group, or and, blue and yellow, and, and, and or yellow, whatever, <laughs> and then have the others that are hovering right around that five percent plus or minus or whatever we want to choose, just be uh, on, not highlighted, and so that so that people can at least cast their eye on it. But I think there's a problem in hiding the figures because people are going to wonder what they are. I'd, oh, I'd love people want to see. Yeah, a lot of people want to speak, <laughs> and um, I would love if Ed would also sort of tune into the decimal point conversation. Um, Scott, David, Jim, Jim, Caleb, and yeah. I vote for two decimal points. So Great. Three. Okay. Okay. And I think I you know, one. maybe just <laughs> for if Julia could just like, I don't know, use a color yellow, whatever. Um, identify all of the districts that actually experience this effect. And then we can look at it and pair it down to the most dramatic ones or whatever sure. from there. Sure, we can definitely do that. Um, I guess my other question would be, if you do want some of these highlighted, it would you would need to determine a, a percentage. I, I know that 5% has been referenced. We could do any, any percent. I, I would say for first cut, like which districts go up and then down or go down and then up and this will start there and see what those yeah. look like yeah. and then. sure I'm, I'm guessing there's probably a dozen maybe yeah yeah two hands yeah. david yeah okay jim yeah um this is a a little bit of a slant but i'll just put it out there because i'm curious how this figures in is if we go um to weights over three years and excuse me to costs over three years in 
and just referred, don't consider weights. Um, what do we do about the <clears throat> school systems like, for instance, North? I'll keep bringing this up. Um, we're going to say, where did our weights go? I just need to understand how the transition works, that I, I clearly don't get it if the weights aren't phased out while the costs are phased in. So the cost factors, I guess. I mean, I just, yeah. I'm, I'll have to ponder this a little bit because I, I don't see. Well, at some point we have to put the, sorry, go <laughs> BMC together and look at them. I did them yeah. for a few districts just by hand here, and they're not very, the changes, differences are not dramatic. Okay. Uh, I think um, they're tiny, but I just pulled out random. Um, that, if, if, if that's correct, then my fears may be assuaged. I have to see. Caleb and then Brad and then. Yeah, I don't know. There's some pretty big changes between B and C. If you look at Burlington, Burlington has got the biggest change of almost any, of a lot of districts. Burlington's got a big change in across cost of Of course, bigger change than what have on their weights, but that's that's a different conversation. Burlington goes from 1.48 on table C to only 1.45. So they're getting almost none of their benefit in the first year under table C. Under table B, it's significantly different. They go from 1.48 to 1.39. So they do get approximately one third of their full transition. There's just a lot, there's a lot of people because you're just getting rid of weights entirely, not much happens in year one in table C. Winooski, for example, like they've got 41 cents to drop. So a third should be what, 13, 14%. Instead they drop 6% and then they drop 35% the next year. That's pretty uneven. Um, and, and then they're done of course, because they're down at 1%, they can't drop anymore. But, um, if you again look at Winooski on table C, you're going to see, you know, basically it's going to split the difference a little bit more. You know, it, they're going to they're going to lose 19 cents and then 22 cents. So at least the 41 that they're losing, they're doing in two relatively even chunks instead of six percent compared to 30 something percent. So I do think that like the dropping of the weights entirely, it just means that like this is a three year transition that it's not. I think when we do a three-year transition, it would really be nice to see like tax rates adjusted relatively evenly in those three tranches or three chunks, as opposed to 90% of your change in one year, which I'm just seeing a lot of people see. I, I mean, I think it's going to be helpful for me to have you sort of add more detail and layers to this, Julia, because I, you know, 90% in one year, um, I can't run that math in my head as I'm sort of scanning between these two. And so having um, some more sort of definition to the scale of the change in each year would be helpful. One thing that just the highlights that Emily always point out is the yields. If you just go to the top line yields. Yeah. You've got a reduction of 855 from base to year one. Mm -hmm. By the time you go from year two to year three, you've got a reduction of 1400. So it's not a factor of two, but it's probably 1.8. And so that's just like, it also points to that same effect that you're, if you look at table B, you've got a reduction of the yield of 1,200, 1,200, 1,200, pretty much. Yep. You've got 855, 1250, 1450. You know, so it's, um, that that kind of points to the to the problem, but just at the yield, or, or at least the, the shape of this transition. I don't know if it's a problem, but it's not even. Jenna and then, Brad, I think. Well, I, I think what Caleb is saying sort of underscores for me that what we need is we need to we need to look at enough data so that we can identify the areas where we have concerns, and if they're small enough to address, you know, sort of ad hoc uh, individually, we'll do that. And if it if it's through everything, then that tells us we you know we've got a bigger problem. Um, but first of all, we just need to do some slicing and dicing. Brad. Come on, here we go. Am I there? Well, there, okay. Brad James, Agency of Education. This is kind of just going back to what Representative Beck said and what the initial discussion was about the, the numbers of decimal points shown. And again, it doesn't matter. You guys kind of moved on, but the re only reason we were showing three is what I said the other day, is some districts are going to, when you round to two, are going to show a zero, zero. Um, the example that I saw on Julia's data, I think was, 
um, IRA in, in Rutland County. They, they're at 0 0.002. And it, it would just show as, as 0 0.00, which is fine. Uh, but I but I but I do agree that probably showing two decimal places is better than showing three. And that's you know, the rest of it I'll let you guys discuss at the moment. And Brad, I think I've asked you this before, but when we're sort of looking at effects that we think might um, still have a reasonable magnitude in two years, giving, you know, with new current year data, what, what magnitude seems sort of reasonable to you and what seems um, something that will be lost in the noise of all the other changes? We've been playing with 5%, but I, again, I'm still not, you know, sure that I, 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 I think I, before I answer that question, I, let, let me take a little a, a look I, at, at some more data and, and just see what kind of a normal change is or what some of the extremes changes have been in the past, say, three or four years. Because um, I have not done that any time recently. I don't remember what I did in the past. So I, 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 I'll take a look at that and get back to you on that. Yeah. Um, Brad, this may be a question for you. Um, I'm sure you heard Caleb suggesting it would be nice if the transition, say, in Burlington or any place could happen in even tranches over three years or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, given your, um, Julia's, uh, I'll call it uh, infinite mm -hmm. modeling, you know, which is yes. really helpful to see, would it be possible for the, for the agency to, um, the year back office, construct a, a uh, formula so that you get a beginning point and an end point and the, and the tra uh, tax rates end up changing in roughly equal amounts over three years? Well, I think part of the problem, Jim, is that we have no idea what the end point is. We don't know what the end point is. Exactly. We don't know what the end point is. Good answer. Thank you. We're assuming the spending at the end point is the same as the spending at the beginning okay. point. There's it. no world That's where that happens. Thing. Thank you. Same yeah. kids, same everything. All right. Carol, I don't know if this is the right question to ask, but as you, as the, the rate goes down, if a district says, well, I'm going to use that difference to improve educational equality for students, and the spending actually goes to the total amount that the rate has gone down, then what would that do? And let's just say everybody spent up to that amount that they would be otherwise saving. And they then others steady. Yeah. Pardon. They keep their tax rates where they are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. thank you. They keep their and, and let's say that the others who who would otherwise have a choice between lowering raising tax rates or or cutting spending all decide, well, we're going to raise tax rates. What would happen to the yield in those years, in the in the last year? Julia. It would still go down. And then when the yield goes down, what happens? When the yield goes down, tax rates go up. So everybody yeah. would pay for the increase in spending afforded the people who, especially the people for whom they're getting more money to spend on kids. Yeah. So that's the system. How do, that's yeah. The system. So how does that overall impact education spending overall? Do we end up spending more overall? I'm trying to get at what this does to... I mean, the question I heard you ask is if the districts that are getting a tax cut decide to spend more with that tax cut and not yeah. get a tax cut, they yeah. spend more. And if the districts that um, are getting a tax increase but want to maintain their budgets, mm -hmm. then... Spend that goes spending up. goes up for the whole state and everything. I mean, spending goes, if spending goes up, spending goes up. That's the, I mean, you answered your own question, I think. But yeah, but we don't know. Yeah, I know, but let's say that that's it. what, oh, what if we did model it and say, okay, let's, one hypothetical is that it goes up, then how much more in, by year four, would we as a state be spending on education? 
I think the question we would need to answer to model people spending more is how much more people would spend. And I don't know how we would ever we need to know what's going to happen to sales tax revenue, what's going to happen to the number of kids in the school, what's going to happen to inflation. You know, there's a whole lot of other things going on. And if, if you if you if you run uh, just have one dynamic uh, uh, factor and everything else is static, you you know, all right. That's why I said I don't know what I'm trying to ask a question. Sure. Yep. Just, it's a great question. It's a good question. All right. Carol. Yes. If education spending goes up by nine million. Yeah. Then the, the rates go up by one penny. Okay. That gives you a framework to that's it, and that's unless sales tax revenue goes up and more. That's true. I mean, yeah, right. if some an underlying consumption tax explodes, then that could change that. Right? Yeah. Um, Julia, do you want anything before David? I guess I would just like to reiterate what, what the committee has been saying. And with respect to the, the reason that we hold all of these things constant and are only changing one aspect is so that we can see what a change in that one aspect is really going to look like. So when you, the more assumptions that you layer in that are changing the base, the more difficult it is to attribute this change, what does that look like versus what does this change look like, which is why we're assuming all of these constants and then just putting in the new system and looking at it. And as, as the committee has said, if, if your scenario were to happen, education spending would increase. Um, but the same would hold true in, in the current system where yeah. districts that decide to spend more money more education spending for equalized pupil, that also corresponds with an increase in education spending. So we really, we it, it's it's incredibly difficult. It, it's modeling an increase in education spending from from my perspective, as just looking at the numbers, it, it really wouldn't tell us anything because we would also have to assume, you know, within each district, how is each district changing the education their their education yeah. spending. And and just just assuming within each district how that education spending would change is just I, I, it's an inter, it's a it's an interesting question. I wish I had a more satisfying answer. No, I and appreciate it. But I heard you also say really clearly this we have this exact same problem and the exact same dynamics with weights or cost factors. It's the right. you know, if spending goes up, spending goes up. Yeah. <laughs> David and then Caleb. Um, I have two questions. One, Julia, is whether you think there's a better approach that we haven't thought of yet that <laughs> we haven't asked you to model. And, and I'm just going to put that out there. Maybe you maybe you don't have that right now. But yeah, no. When we were talking about this the other day, walking through the the bill, I think for the first time, um, we had some conversation about averages of averages, meaning. Um, where we were looking back for calculating ADM, I think and we were looking back at, at two years, uh, you know, of of enrollment, and then, and and so so, and I'm a little confused now, and I'm a little fuzzy on what exactly it, that was. But I just want to be sure that in year one, so on either chart B or chart C, are are we is, is the calculation looking back to previous years that like FY18, FY19, that may be skewing the, these calculations somewhat? So if, if I understand the question, we're using all of this adjusted FY2020 data. The Senate, the, the S287 that passed the Senate, the transition mechanism that was presented there was averaging the multiple years, so FY16 through FY20, and then moving forward with those rolling averages, so to speak, over time, that's not being that's not being included in, in these models. Okay. okay. And is that because we made a collective decision or or you thought we had not to do that, or is that a function of the calculation that you can't do that? Um that's because what we've been asked to model, it's okay. really at the end of the day up to the committee to decide what what makes sense during this transition. Yeah, okay. 
Good. Thank you. If that that that's helpful. I just wanted to be sure that we weren't doing doing that. Brad, do you want to jump in? I I I no, Julie Julie got it. I was just going to say it, it's two completely different models that we're talking about. The weighting model, the transition was based on averaging equalized pupils over over a period of years, and that's the average of the averages that I was speaking about. Um, when we're talking about the the cost factor model, which is in front of you. We're we're the way we're talking about it now is the transition would go to two options. The transition would go from one year of equalized pupils to long term ADM, you know, over over time, or going straight to long term ADM, and then and in both cases, in both those scenarios, averaging uh, or or parsing out or phasing in the the catalog, the cost factor adjustment grants. So, so that's that's really it. It's, it's just two two different concepts. The averaging of the averaging is, is on the weighting side as proposed from the Senate. Thank you. Caleb. Yeah, and I mean that to me is a little a little unfortunate that I, I don't think we really looked at the Senate bill much. We kind of amended it to this new draft request, and that's really what we looked at. And the, the thing about that is that we haven't seen this kind of transition numbers. I don't feel like we have for the Senate version. I know we saw one chart from Brad, but we haven't spent much time on it. Um, we have talked a little bit about the differences between the versions, but it's just that we waited for a long time to get S-287. We immediately did a draft request that completely flipped it uh, with limited testimony. So what we're really hearing about a lot is cost factor adjustments, but we're not hearing much about how it compares to S.287. They do have like some different mechanisms, but if we're talking about the notion that there's so much new stuff coming that we're kind of just guessing, which I continue to hear. Um, there's more guessing, I think, when we're looking at cost factor adjustments, because you've got the whole change to the yield, you've got the whole change to what counts as education spending. So in addition to just saying, okay, well, we've got a problem with our old, old weights, we're going to fix them by just like axing the whole program and substituting a new thing that is inherently harder to model. I mean, there are challenges with modeling replacing weights, but I think it's significantly more unknowns that are introduced. And again, it's like the yields kind of tell the story. Uh, if you look at the transition under new weights, of course the yields bounce around, but not nearly to the degree that they plummet in this model. And that, We've got a lot of policy decisions about how we set the yield that would be fundamentally impacted by going this direction. And I don't think we fully teased those out yet. So it just like, I think the kind of guesswork long term feels greater in this model. And it would be kind of nice to at some point be able to go back kind of side by side it with the Senate's decision, since I think they looked at a lot of these same um, factors and coming to that conclusion. Julia, am I remembering right that? I've looked at a lot of tables in the last month, but am I remembering right that um, the, when we got the Senate bill, we looked at both the model from Brad that he sort of introduced to the Senate, and then we also looked at some side by sides. Yes. Okay. Um, we have we have done that. I would be happy to walk the committee through that again if it would be helpful. Um, may I speak yeah. briefly about the yield? Yeah. Please. Um, because this is something that I was thinking. When, when trying to understand the two different systems and um, think about the calculation of the yield, I think it's important to note, and this is something that that I I think I, I briefly touched on in the introduction to cost factor adjustments, but because the cost factor adjustments are being sort of taken out from the school's voted, the district's voted budget, before the education spending per pupil is calculated, it means that a district's, with the cost factor adjustments, a district's education spending per pupil that's being used to calculate its adjusted taxes is going to be, assuming all else content, is going to be lower, right? Because those cost factor adjustments right are not included in the education spending per pupil that's being used to calculate the adjusted rate. So for that reason, the yield in turn also needs to decrease, not necessarily um, because it's it's in the same, it needs to decrease because, because 
assuming all it's constant, right, that education spending per pupil within the district is also going to decrease. So the yield needs to decrease to reflect that new or that change in calculation. Just to, just to clarify, I don't know if I've mentioned that in terms of the, um, the tables that I presented here. So I think that's just helpful to clarify. And then Scott. Uh, and, and just uh, the, the next step, I think, is that the, the reason is that the yield has to raise that money that's going out in the cost factors. That, that's its function. Um, and so that, that, that's the interplay here. Yes, thank you. Scott, did you? I, yeah, I'm just trying to, going back to um, David's question of, is there a different way of doing this? Maybe what I'm thinking of. Um, you know, a, a two-year transition would eliminate a lot of this unwelcomed effect that we're seeing in, in C. <laughs> um, so would I just ban, just do it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm wondering if maybe a, a, a two-year transition or just a full implementation with um, some throttles for certain districts might actually be uh, a model that might make more sense. Don't give Jim a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think throttles. We, I want. I want to make sure that like yeah, word throttles just, is highlighted in what you're saying. And, 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 and let's not forget, governors. I think. I yeah. think. I, I think I'm correctly yeah. saying this. Um, we are not talking about the first year of implementation until 25. So that. You know, nothing's going to happen in 24, but it does give the district some time to start getting on the ramp. Carol? Okay, so I'm glad you said that what you just said, Julia, um, the yield will go down. So when, I, and I, I heard you, Scott, say what, a, what $9 million costs, Penny. Yeah. Do we have any charts that show where in the state the money comes from? Like who is most, who's putting money in from what? I know we have the circle of property taxes and sales tax, but I mean, when it's coming in, where's it coming in from? Yeah, so, so because of the, because of the, the, the way that the system has been adjusted since the Brigham decision, the money that's coming into the education fund is not a, a, a tax rate is not a function of the town's property wealth, but rather the district, uh, the education spending per pupil that that district has decided on. Yeah, I, guess I, I, I guess I would offer too that, um, yeah. Scott's favorite orange book yeah. is a very good source for answering all those questions. Yeah. Okay, I'm open there. So, so it, it is, it is um, I have jumped in. We, we have it in the past, we haven't done it so much this year, talked about all the things that go into the Ed Fund and the different proportions and roughly a third, a third, a third, a, you know, a third uh, uh, non homestead, a third homestead income and a third non-property tax it shifts a little bit but it's roughly that um but basically the property tax money it, the education tax money comes in from people who have income and have property wherever they live that's that's what that's the way the system is supposed to work right? if you've got more people with more money in one part of the state they're paying more in on income tax no matter what yeah, so it's just, almost the more people in a place, well, the more there is the contribution. No, to, they're not get, doing a disproportionate contribution. It's just that the aggregate numbers are, are bigger. It's not disproportionate. All right. Yeah, a couple of different comments um, from this conversation the last little bit. Um, I appreciate Caleb's saying that um, using, uh, you say, unfamiliar numbers, you know, you know that would, uh, in, in exact numbers has um, poses poses some some um, inherent difficulties. But I would also say that the system that we've been operating under for 
any number of years has been um, um, inherently complicated. Um, and I think moving to weights straightens that out to the greatest extent that we can do that within the context of what we're working on. Um, and that um, my train of thought. Um, go back to my other point. Um, I have no objection. I have no problem with the fact that you can only change one factor at a time. Um, one of the basic rules of, that I learned the hard way from auto mechanics is if there's something wrong with your car, you only change one part at a time. Otherwise, so so these the models, these models are used as, as we kind of work our way forward. But at the at the end of the end of the day, school districts will work. Um, school boards they work with. You know the numbers that we finalize. You know that what the system turns out to be, and and, and we work with tax rates. And um, and I find if we, if we do it all at once, Scott, versus you know over a couple of years, um, I have some considerations on that score. Um, the throttles, that's it. The throttles, you know, the guardrails. You know, um, we've talked about some things to sort through, but but I just assume end up with a better system than, than um, adding some rickety ladders to something that is not the best system at all anyway. So that's why I like weights. Transmission will be um, anyway, so that's enough. From the table B. Do you mean you, do you like table B better than table C? Or you like, um, the, I, um, when you say you like weights, are you saying you like the... I like cost factors. Okay. You know, and, and how we tinker with the math over a couple of years is something to be decided. Okay. Um, I'm not inherently opposed to either set, you know, three years, two years, all at once. Um, which get it said a couple of times going um, to uh, away from equalized pupils um, because it eliminates an unnecessary complication. I think with George. I think with that, um, it's almost ten fifteen. So I think we're going to take a break until ten thirty. <laughs> Sorry, George. <laughs> Rush to settle in. Um, and we'll come.